Jeff Zwerink. Welcome back to Give and Take, the segment of our show where we explore important scientific ideas and see how they relate to the truth of Christianity. Today, I'm joined by my friend and colleague, Dr. Fuzz Rana, and we're going to talk about the Krebs cycle. Fuzz, good to have you here today. Jeff, thanks for having me. So I'll be honest, the Krebs cycle is one of those things that I remember hearing about in my biology class. I know it's got a lot of complicated chemistry in it. But I'd kind of like to just start off today, kind of tell us what is the Krebs cycle and what role does it play in life, if you will? Yeah, well, you know, in my opinion, the Krebs cycle is probably one of the most important metabolic pathways inside the cell. In fact, it's more or less universally located uh, in the cells of all living organisms. And it's part of what biochemists call intermediary metabolism. And for a biochemist, metabolism refers to the sum total of all the chemical reactions that are taking place inside the cell. And there's a subset of those reactions that are called intermediary metabolic pathways. And these pathways are used to break down compounds so energy can be liberated to power the cell's operation. They are also used to build the building block materials that would make things like proteins and fatty acids and sugars and in, in nucleobases and things like that. Uh, and so they're, they're very important, uh, very important pathways. Uh, and these pathways typically are organized by a sequence of chemical reactions where the starting compound undergoes small successive modifications till it produces the final product, where each step is mediated by what biochemists call an enzyme that facilitates that transformation. And the pathways can be linear, they can be branched, they can be circular. The Krebs cycle is a circular pathway. And some of the pathways actually interconnect with one another. So when you look at the metabolic chart, it looks like a, a roadmap for a, a very large city where the pathways are like the, the, the roadway system in that city. But the Krebs cycle sits right at the center of all of intermediary metabolism. It's part of what biochemists call central carbon metabolism, where it takes the breakdown products of glucose and breaks them down further into CO2 and water and uses that energy to power uh, most of the cell's operations. But also the intermediates in that cyclical pathway can be siphoned off and used to make amino acids and nucleobases and fats and sugars. So it's a, it's a core metabolic pathway that really uh, resides at the very heart of, of intermediary metabolism and really the heart of biochemistry. So it, it really does strike me as this is an, a very important aspect of all life. Cause I mean, you know, you could, you can, you know, my vision of the cell is there's kind of these little groups of things, but all of the chemical interactions, it seems like they ultimately are anchored onto this Krebs cycle, if you will, either they use a product of, or they're part of the link. It, it really seems very central to life here on earth. Am I correct in that? Yeah, that's exactly right. It's, it, it's central. And again, it's, it's universally distributed among life forms. Every organism is made up of one or more cells and all of those cells have uh, a Krebs cycle, a version of the Krebs cycle in them. And because of its central importance, you know, many people that study the origin of life question think that if they can understand how the Krebs cycle could have emerged, uh, you know, through chemical evolution, that they can gain insight into the origin of life question. So, so this, so this does seem to have origin of life ties in. Um, so, are you saying in looking at the origin of life, they're looking at somehow this cycle may have been set up outside the cell and then incorporated into the cell? Is that what you're talking about? Yes. Yeah. That that class of explanations is called metabolism first pathways, where metabolic reactions would have emerged as autocatalytic cycles that then later became encapsulated in kind of in, in, in protocellular systems encapsulated within membrane systems. Uh, but what's interesting so, is that- Hold on, given the complexity, if that seems a little bit bizarre that this complex set of interactions would happen somewhere out in the environment. I mean, is there evidence that this happened on the early earth or when life was forming? Yeah, yeah, well, there, there actually is because um, uh, for example, uh, in the early 2000s, uh, the late, uh, uh, Harold Morowitz, who, when he was alive, was a very prominent origin of life researcher, actually determined 
that the components of the Krebs cycle, the intermediates that are part of the Krebs cycle, have a really unusual set of chemical properties that make them very likely to form under the conditions of the early earth and persist, that they have this just right set of properties that make them uh, inherent in, in prebiotic chemistry, that they would be a, a natural outworking of, of prebiotic reactions. And then more recently, two independent teams of researchers have shown that you can start with a, a, a chemical compound called glyoxalate or, and or pyruvate and through very simple reactions in the lab, generate all of the Krebs cycle intermediates. And in fact, the sequence in which you generate those Krebs cycle intermediates is the sequence in which they appear in the, in the Krebs cycle pathway. And so it looks as if it's very easy under the conditions of the early earth to make these Krebs cycle intermediates. Uh, uh, and, and again, these uh, compounds that are part of this pathway have a really unusual and just right set of properties that, that make them conducive to forming and persisting under the conditions of the early earth. So the fact that this very complex, very important chemical cycle, this pathway, this Krebs cycle seems to almost be naturally flow out of the early earth chemistry, that seems to lend credence to an origin of life or to a naturalistic or an evolutionary origin of life scenario. But I think you actually argue it points to a creator. How do you, how do you draw that contrast there? Yeah. Yeah. And, and to be clear, um, you know, Jeff, you and I are, are skeptics of at least aspects of the evolutionary paradigm. I'm skeptical that chemical evolution in an unguided sense could ever produce a cell starting with simple chemical molecules. But let's say for the sake of argument that you assume or you adopt the view that, that chemical evolution is the way to explain the origin of life. What this is telling us is that these Krebs cycle intermediates didn't just simply emerge through chance as a part of a historically contingent evolutionary process, but rather they seem to be fundamentally prescribed by the very laws of nature, that the, the conditions of the early earth were just right to support carbon chemistry. And that carbon chemistry has the just right set of properties to produce these Krebs cycle intermediates that have a just right set of properties for prebiotic chemistry, but also have the just right set of properties for them to function as the central hub for metabolism. So it's a, a series of coincidences that are all stacked on top of each other that are highly suspicious, that suggest that there seems to be some intentionality and purpose that undergirds even prebiotic chemistry. And, and that to me, it, you know, suggests there's maybe a mind that has jimmy rigged everything at the very beginning uh, so that life is possible. So in other words, whether you adopt the view that we hold where God is intervening to bring about the origin of life in a direct way, or you adopt an evolutionary view, you can't escape the fact that at minimum, uh, the, a creator must have jimmy rigged everything for life to be possible and probably uh, intervened to bring it about. You know, it, it's remarkable because what you're talking about sounds a lot like what I see from Fred Hoyle as he's looking at how carbon is produced in stars, that he sees these remarkable coincidences that if they were not that way, we wouldn't get life. In fact, he his kind of conclusion was a super intellect monkeyed with physics. It seems like that's what you're arguing here, correct? It, that's exactly right. And, and I really appreciate you uh, drenching to, to Fred Hoyle and in, in what is known as the anthropic uh, principle, you know, in cosmology, you know, that everything has to be just right for, for life to be possible. And, uh, and we see that same, you know, set of just right conditions that are needed, interestingly enough, even for uh, the prebiotic chemistry needed for uh, the Krebs cycle. Well, thanks very much, Fuzz. I appreciate your comments. Uh, you know, when we look at the universe, it is remarkable that we can explain and understand and describe so much of the universe. And, and what Fuzz has brought to us here today is this recognition that it seems like physics and chemistry are designed or put together in such a way that this important component of life, the Krebs cycle, flows out of the conditions of the early Earth. It really does point towards a mind or a creator.
you know, I would encourage you to go to reasons.org and check out Fuzz's blog on this. It's called Krebs Cycle Origin Brings Case for Creation Full Circle. Gives you a lot of biochemical details on what's going on, but more importantly than that, helps you see the big picture and how as we study and know more about creation, we find more evidence to point people towards the creator behind it all.